All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the Science of Animal Eye. So I am Monica McCubrey. I'm with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. I'm the wildlife education specialist with them. Uh, we started Science of back in 2020, so we've been going for a few years, and um, I continuously try to think of new things to talk about, but every time that I send you evaluations, uh, please take a second and fill those out and give me some more ideas about things that you would all like to hear. So uh, we'll go ahead and share my screen. Well, we have a lot to get through today. I know I always say that, but we do have a lot to get through today. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get going. All right. So uh, like I mentioned, this is going to be talking about animal eyes today. So not only just the eye and what it does in an animal, but also the different types of vision that different types of animals see and why they have those sometimes advantages over people and also disadvantages over people as well. So um, if you've been on a science of before, you know that I love questions and I love that you're chatting about this. So please feel free to use the chat uh, to comment or to have questions. We will at the very end have kind of like a, com or a comment section or a um, question and answer session towards the end. Just make sure that everything you ask is on topic. Otherwise, we do have that right to remove you from our program. All right. I also want to point out that I'm by me, no means an expert in um, animal eyes or anything that I've talked about. Um, I am a science communicator, so I feel like I'm very good at how to communicate that. Um, but I'm definitely going to say that I've not been studying this for years and years. So if you have questions for me that I can't answer, I will do my best to find someone that can answer those and get back to you. All right, so let's go ahead and jump on into eyes, kind of why we have them, what's the difference between them. So eyes are a very complex system in a lot of different types of animals, especially people. Um, we have uh, pretty good vision, but by no means the best vision of the animal kingdom. Uh, we're pretty, sometimes pretty arrogant as people and humans thinking that we have the best, we are the best. And there's other animals out there that have um, better eyes, better vision for because they need it for different thing. So let's go ahead and start talking about what eyes are and kind of the purpose of them and how they've evolved over time. So um, thinking very, very vaguely about this and kind of the overarching idea of this is that we need the sun for energy. So an overwhelming a number of animals and organisms and plants, they need the sun to survive. So um, same with people, it feeds um, a lot of the things that we eat and some of the things directly and all that energy goes throughout the trophic levels. We all know this. Um, so what is the reason of telling you all that is because light. So light is a key thing to why um, eyes have evolved over time. So one of those reasons is because animals, even those single cell things like algae and protists and microbes, they can swim away or towards the light. They understand that light and dark they don't have super complex optic systems like people or mammals do, um, but they understand light versus dark. And so that's some of the very, very beginning reasons why animals needed light and they needed eyes to take in that light and detect that light. Um, some animals have taken this and kind of gone to the next level when we look at something as very simple as like a single celled algae versus like a fox. There's a very big difference when we're talking about their eyes and their optic systems. Um, but we're also talking about animals that very early, it was just a matter of detecting light. Is it dark or is it light where I am? But it has moved past that and become a very complex system. So when we talk about animal species, there's about 96% of animal species have an eye or have eyes. And so the variation of how, the, how complex those are is very different. But when we talk about animals in general, there's about 96% of species have eyes. Um, we also talk about this because um, animals need to detect light. Um, the very first eyes, they didn't really do much else. It was mostly, again, is it light or dark? But over time, they've evolved into predators and prey. So predators needing to understand how to see prey from a distance and having better visual acuity. So the idea of understanding how far away something is, the depth of it, how clear of an image your eyes can focus in on. And then same on the opposite end with those prey animals 
as well. So can prey see shadows? Can they see a predator approaching? Um, just anything that gives them an upper hand on that survival advantage over those that don't have those things. And so even when we're talking about a very simple eye, um, even a slight improvement on even that image quality can provide like a significant survival advantage to a lot of those different types of animals. All right. Whoop. Oh gosh, sorry everyone. Okay, so when we talk about an eye, what is an eye? It is in simpleality, it is the organ of vision. It is something where we take in that image and we make it and understand and send signals to our brain telling us what we're seeing. Um, so it detects light, it converts it into those electrochemical impulses in our neurons. Um, and basically the simplest photoreceptor cells, um, the things that give us those images, um, they can connect light to movement. So over time, it has been more of a just can I detect light into what's happening. And then when we talk about higher order organisms, so when we talk about this, I don't really like using this, but this is what a lot of papers use, higher versus lower organisms. Um, when they talk about a lower organism, they're talking about a very simple like single celled animal or single celled organism versus something like a mammal um, is a higher order organism. So when we talk about a higher organism, this very um, complex optic system, um, basically it's collecting light from the environment. It regulates the intensity through a diaphragm that's in your eye. Um, our eyes are able to focus in on it. We can adjust if necessary. Um, the lenses will form then an image. Um, with people, when we see something, our eyes actually see it upside down, but then when it comes into our eyes, we flip it so we can see it right side up. Not every animal does that. Um, there's some animals like insects, they don't do that. They just don't need to see it upside down. They see it right side up when it comes into their eye. Um, but then over time, once we see that image, we kind of focus in on what we're seeing. It converts it into those electrical signals, which then transmits those signals to our brain. And then through complex pathways, we're basically saying, okay, I know what I'm seeing. Um, and then uh, I can see how far away something is, how strong that image is, how clear that image is. And then over time that eye via the um, optic nerve um, will go to other areas of the brain and help us figure out and send those signals to what we're seeing. So it's a very complex system. And when we think about it, it does it so quickly. So when people see something, they convert that into signals and impulses to our brain very, very quickly. It's not a very long process by any means. All right, so how did eyes evolve? So the first what were called proto eyes evolved about uh, 600 million years ago. So right about the time of this Cambrian, what we call a Cambrian explosion. So there was a lot of different types of animals um, and plants coming into this time. Um, this is a huge diversity time that we're seeing. So with these many diverse creatures, we're also seeing a lot of new um, mutations and a lot of new things happening. And one of those were eyes. So over time, it's come to about 96% of species in the animal kingdom and about 35 different main phylas have eyes now. Um, so when we're talking about the evolution of an eye, the last common ancestor of everything that we have now had all the chemical, basically the toolkit necessary for vision. So everything that we have now has from come that common ancestor. They had everything they needed at that time and it's just since then evolved. Um, in most vertebrate animals um, and some mollusks, the eye works by basically allowing light to enter. It projects onto that panel of cells uh, known as the retina at the rear of the eye. Um, so this is just, again, a simple way to detect light, but they took it a step further. All right, so at its simplest, what does the eye do? We know we see photos, we're able to understand depth, um, but basically the three functions of an eye are light detection, um, shading. So what do I mean by shading? Um, it's basically in the form of a dark pigment. It can sense which direction light is coming from. And then also a connection to those motor structures. So um, basically when that light comes in, um, we can have a movement in response to that light. Light. And then some organisms have all three functions. Um, some organisms do not, um, but some of the ones that do, they are all carried out by just one single cell in our eye. 
All right. So the simplest eyes, when we talk about this and kind of working our way up. Um, so eyes have a, a power. Um, they basically come in 10 different forms. Um, and again, some of them have very complex systems. Some of them don't, but scientists kind of have agreed that there's about 10 different types of eyes or forms that they come in. Um, the image resolving eyes are things that we see um, like in mollusks, chordates and arthropods. So things basically that have either a backbone or that are insects or mollusks, those are the ones that resolve in those images. They're not just detecting, is it light or dark? Um, if anyone has ever done things like, um, working in a, in a lab with like nematodes or parasites or things like that, very simple celled organisms. When we used to do bio, biological dissections, like you would hold over your hand dark, like an earthworm for instance, and it would know light versus dark. Um, so it's kind of an interesting uh, experiment to do with that. But again, mammals and birds and fish, they know more than just it's light or dark. They can detect those images um, within their brains. And then those very, very simple eyes when we talk about them, they're those microorganisms. So they really don't detect anything other than the surroundings, whether it's light or dark. And then this helps them with their circadian rhythm. So being able to rest or not rest. All right, so complex eyes, they can distinguish shapes and colors for the most part. Now those colors and shapes might be very different than what humans see. Um, a lot of different animals, and we'll talk about those today, can see colors beyond the spectrum of what humans can see, just like the different frequencies and sound versus humans as well. Um, so same thing as far as eyes. Um, the visual fields of many organisms, like especially predators, they involve a very large area of what we call a binocular vision to improve their depth perception. So binocular, meaning that your eyes basically are in the front of your head. Um, there was this, um, there is a phrase that doesn't really match every single animal, but it's good to kind of remember if you have eyes on the side, you hide eyes in the front, you hunt. Um, so most predators have what we call binocular vision. They're in the front of their eyes. Um, but if you think of like a rabbit, their eyes are on the side of their eye, their head so that they can see more around them um, because they don't need them in the front because they're not hunting. And then in other organisms, eyes are basically located just to maximize their field of view. Uh, so there's a lot of animals out there that have really large eyes or eyes that are farther back in their head, like a woodcock, for instance. They almost look like an alien kind of animal, but their eyes are set very, very far back in their head so that they have almost a 360 degree view so that they can view predators. Um, and then also talking about like rabbits and horses, those are the best examples of like eyes on the side because they are set so far on the side of their head. All right, so simple eyes, they have a single lens when we talk about that. Um, they have also, the simplest eyes are things like in snails. Um, so they have these ocelli, so they can't really see an image in a normal shape like people can. They don't have lenses, but they do have those photosensitive cells. So they can detect light versus dark. Um, and then they can also distinguish other things as well. Is it warm? Is it cold? It's like very, very simple things that they can see, very, very rudimentary skills, but mostly is it light or dark is what those very single celled um, lenses are looking for. All right, and then when we talk about a compound eye, um, great examples are things like insects, um, especially like dragonflies and flies. So when you look at those big red, like bulbous things, people are like, there's the eye. Well, yes, they have an eye, but then if you look very closely, there's all those little dots. So those are all facets or lenses within the larger part of the eye. So each one of those little tiny facets or dots on those on that picture there, they can see something um, and then they form it in ba into basically an entire image. So some animals, depending on what they're eating and how they're hunting, they can have up to about 28,000 sensors, which are arranged in like a hexagon pattern. And this helps them give a 360 degree field of vision. Um, how many of you have ever tried to swat at a fly before and you've ever, you tried to get it and before you even get close to your hand to the fly, it takes off. Um, that's because it has such a wide range view um, that it sees you coming before you even decide to like hit the fly. So 
That's why it's always so hard to capture a fly or a dragonfly, uh, just simply because they have these huge facets and this huge field of vision. They can see you a lot better than you think they can. Um, and then they're also very sensitive to motion. So not only is it I'm coming to get you, if you're a fly, I'm going to swat at you, but they can see a lot of different things. And they're so sensitive to it because that is how they're hunting or that's how they're trying to escape as a prey animal. All right, so I want to talk to you about one of the maybe most complex color vision systems. So we don't have mantis shrimp in Nebraska, but they are in the world and they are deemed probably the most complex color vision. So we would never probably have said a shrimp, um, but this animal is called the mantis shrimp. And people believe that the mantis shrimp are known to have these amazing fields of view because they're looking for a female. Um, and they also display these aggressive um, dances towards other males that may be in their territory and um, that would um, compete with some of the females that they would want. Um, but basically what happens is the um, humans, we can see what are called three channels of color. Shrimp, there are these shrimp in general can see 12 channels of color. So there's colors out there that we don't even know exist that this mantis shrimp can see. Um, they can also perceive depth with one of their eye, not two, but just one, and each eye can move independently from each other. So thinking of like a chameleon, how their eyes move independently, very similar to that of a mantis shrimp. Um, so their eyes are very similar to a fly. So they have a cluster of what are called photoreceptor cells and the support cells and also pigment cells. So if you look closely at their eye, you can kind of see this like middle band that goes through it. And then there's two kind of sections up on top and one on the bottom. Um, so that middle part of the eye um, is called the mid band. And it has six rows. You can't see it, but there's six rows of individual little photoreceptor cells in there that can see different things. Um, so each row is basically specialized to see a special wavelength of light or even polarized light. So being in the water, polarization helps them. Um, the first four rows, you can detect human visible light. So something that we can also see, but then they can also see UV light, which humans cannot unless we have a special flashlight. Um, so in fact, each row um, of those different receptors in the UV gives mantis, mantis shrimp um, a very good UV vision. So way better than just holding something over a flashlight. Um, and then the last two rows on those shrimp, um, they contain really small little hairs. Um, and then this arrangement, we believe, helps with them um, polarization. So understanding if something's polarized light or not polarized light. Um, so when you look at like the overall structure of it, um, the parts of the eye kind of look like they're just hanging out in space. Um, but about 70% of that narrow strip gives them the ability to perceive that depth just with one of their eyes. So they have very, very good vision. So why do they have that again is those courtship displays. So both behaviors um, show colored patches um, that reflect off of another shrimp. So brightness or color, and each one is unique. So that is how they are able to choose which female that they would like. Um, they also have these like flashing patches um, and it provides certain information between two animals. So only certain colors that they can see and the brightness and the intensity of them, they are looking for certain information to communicate communicate between the receiver and the signaler. So it's those special communication pathways via color. And that's why they have to have such amazing color UV light vision. All right, so when we talk about an image, being able to see shapes and images and having them look clearly is a very advanced optic system for a lot of animals. So um, the eye, the more photoreceptors that they have, they have more power to see. Um, when we talk about eyes and the shape of an eye, if you have a cup-shaped eye, you can sense better direction and light and where that movement is coming from as far as where it's bouncing off of those objects. All are very important things if you're a predator or a prey animal. And then as bodies evolved, animals became more complex with the adaptations that they have and also their behaviors that they do. So they needed more complex eye system. So um, over time, 
And that's kind of what happens. So there's special cells in the retina, um, these photoreceptors that basically help convert light into signals that are sent to the brain. So if animals have more photoreceptors, they have more signals that are going to their brain and they're just better at it. Um, it can also detect uh, intensity across a surface as well. So again, if you're an animal like a animal that flies, this is very important for you because animal or light is going to bounce off of objects onto you. Um, and, it, and that could kind of hurt you when you're trying to hunt or when you're trying to find food. All right, so kind of later improving on these eyes, um, eye connections resulted in more muscle cells. So more things inside the eye that are able to move the eye, direct it into a certain uh, direction because a lot of those simple animals like a snail, they don't have muscles in their eyes to move them around. Um, it was more just like waving cilia. And then the neurons also evolved. Um, they could process more signals and then also coordinate that behavior into the animal. So if I'm seeing light, it's coming into me, it's very bright, I'm feeling very hot, I need to go into the shade. So all of those different chemical pathways and signals really help the animal process over time. And then also later improvements, um, they added more structures into the eye um, simply so that they could see better. So these would be things like mirror images or lens that can gather and focus on that light. Um, also, animals' eyes kind of became spherical over time. They developed pupils. Um, they're able to close them or open them, get them bigger or smaller, just to let more light in if they needed to. And then also the muscles around the eye um, we all know people have issues with like their optic nerve or different muscles that are in our eyes. Animals also can have that too, but those muscles really help fine tune and our focus and then also point in the different directions that we can see things. So um, photoceptors basically increased in number to provide more detailed images to what animals were seeing. Another kind of a fine tune thing are called opsins. So these opsins detect light. They do it very well. Um, they can change basically the shape that they are in. They could go from a resting state to a signaling state upon light absorption, and it activates a certain G protein, therefore results in a signaling basically cascade that goes from all these physiological responses. So the letting the light in, and then it's signaling things to your brain, and it's telling you to move or not. Um, before being used in an eye, opsins had a variety of other jobs. Um, so things in like fungi, green algae, um, opsins act as pumps and sensory molecules. Um, it was basically like an ion channel for light and it helped um, regulate that circadian rhythm. So that's really what they are in single celled and very simple organisms. Um, and then over time, they evolved only once. So all the animal opsins that are now basically modified versions of that ancestor lived 600 million years ago. So it evolved once. And then ever since that, those animals have used them for 600 million years. Um, many species have multiple opsins, um, which allows them to, to see a very broad range of wavelengths, um, more than just like basic color vision. So we'll talk about that in different animals and what they see here in a second too. All right, there's also rods and cones got developed. So cone cells are for color, rod cells are for letting in low light. Um, and so in the retina, they detect and basically convert light into those neural signals for vision. So um, the visual signals then are then transmitted to the brain via that optic nerve. Um, such cell or such eyes are typically uh, spherical when we talk about rods and cones or that spherical color or that spherical shape. Um, and they are transparent. They have that what's called that vitreous humor. Um, it also helps focus the lens. And there's often an iris in these um, little bit more complex eyes that we talk about. Um, so the relaxed Relaxing and the tightening of the muscles that are around the iris will change the size of the pupil. Uh, so therefore, if there's a lot of light coming in, your pupils are going to be small. If it's really dark, they're open to let more light in. Um, and that basically helps um, the animal hunt at night or find prey or food or shelter or whatever it needs. So it's trying to let the optimum amount of light in so that they can see. All right. So that was like 
that could have been a whole science of is just talking about the the pathways and the muscles in the eye and how they've evolved over time. But that was like a quick thing about the different um, adaptations, like the rods and cones and the obsins, um, adding all those different things into a very simple eye. So now I thought we could go ahead and look at different groups of animals and how their eyes um, are very different from each other, but also have some similarities. I didn't really talk about mammalian eyes. Um, I tried to hit some other types of animals here, but when we talk about it, I'm going to discuss and compare between a mammal eye because they're one of the most like complex out there. I guess it depends on who you talk to when we say complex um, as far as the muscles and the systems that they have, but I'll let you kind of be the judge of what animal eyes you would like to have. So let's go ahead and dive into insect eyes. Uh, so there's a lot when we look at an insect, there's tons of different types of insects, um, but most insects have what we call a compound eye. Um, so they're made up of these very basic units. Um, we've looked at those like in the fly, those little dots that are in there. Um, so these really basic units in the eye, um, and they have this kind of curved microscopic lens. So if you look at this butterfly species, it looks like this really big bead um, that's kind of bulging out of it. Um, but basically, what happens is each tiny lens that's in there um, makes an individual image and then the brain puts all those images together to achieve a peripheral vision without the insect having to move its head. Um, so if you're an insect and you're trying to be still so that you do not get eaten or you're trying to find animals to eat, you don't want to be moving around your head a lot to find things. You want to be able to do that. So each of those little facets in your eye um, can see an image and then the brain basically puts it together to see a wide range of things so you never have to move, which is very ad advantageous for a lot of those insects. Um, another advantage of this is that we talked earlier about when humans see an image, our brain has to, we see it actually upside down and then our brain puts it right side up. Uh, insects don't do that. They see it right side up the first time, which is very different than a mammal eye. Um, but basically that helps them. Um, so insects don't have to focus on an object then by changing the shape of the lens or the position of their lens or their head. Um, so they don't really have to move closer or farther away from something. They just see it. Um, some insects have really great visual acuity. Some do not. Um, dragonflies are ones that have amazing eyes because they are flying in the air. They're capturing animals right out of the air to eat. Um, so they have to have good depth perception Perception, they have to have good focusing, they have to have a good clear image to be able to get their food. Um, male flies actually have a really good eyesight as well, um, better than females because female flies um, they get stalked is kind of the best way to put it. Um, so males will actually stalk a female to try to get her to mate with her with him. Um, and so what they will do is they have to have that good peripheral vision and that visual acuity to see the female at a distance so he can stalk her is basically the, the idea of a fly. Um, but males will have better images than females will. All right, bees and hoverflies, they have really interesting eyes as well. If you've ever looked at like a bumblebee, um, so they have two sets of eyes. They have compound and simple eyes. Uh, the compound eyes are like the big ones that are pretty noticeable on the side of the head. The simple eyes are a little bit smaller and sometimes they're on the head or the side as well, depending on the species and where they're located. Um, but some Bees and butterflies and hoverflies, they will see uh, what are called nectar guides. Um, if you ever look up on Google or YouTube what a nectar guide is, it's a special, uh, basically it's a map to tell the insects where that nectar is. If anyone knows what a petunia is, um, petunias are flowers that are kind of cup shaped so that you can go in and get the nectar inside. Um, if you looked at them under a UV light, there's special little bands that are sometimes white or yellow, green, uh, just depends on the species, that show basically a roadmap to, for those bees to where to get that, um, that nectar or that pollen. So it helps the animals because they're getting something to eat and it helps the plants because they're getting that pollen on them to be able to uh, go to another flower and distribute that there. So um, they're, they're called nectar guides. Um, not every single plant has them and some are way more noticeable than others, um, but it's kind of cool. Petunias are one that are really good. You can see them very easily. 
And then, like I mentioned earlier, the simple eyes are like these little tiny bumps at the top of their triangle head. And basically the only purpose of these is they can detect that light and help guide the animal to what direction they want to go relative to the sun. All right, we talked about dragonfly eyes earlier. So if you ever looked at a dragonfly, they have these like huge bulbous looking eyes that cover about the majority of their head. Um, this helps them be able to catch food right out of the air during flight. Um, so these are apex predators of the insect world. Um, even though they're small, they are predatory and they eat a ton of things like mosquitoes, which people really like. Um, these guys also have eyes on the top of their head and they can see almost a perfect 360 degree field of vision around them. Very much helps getting in their food. Um, they're also extremely successful when they capture animals. Um, on average, they have about a nine 95% capture rate. So every time they go out to get something, um, on average, 95% of the time they get something. Whereas African lions have a 25% capture rate. Uh, so very big difference, even though uh, African lions have way, I guess you could, some people say way better um, eyes or more complex eyes. Um, Clearly, it does not match up. There's advantages to each and disadvantages to each, but these guys are doing very well. Uh, the compound eyes have this basically this dorsal region, um, the upper region that detects light from the sky um, from above, and then a ventral reason, a region that collects light that's reflected off of objects on the ground. Um, so these guys, the top really deflects the light from the sky. The bottom of their eye reflects that light on the ground, um, especially because these animals are around a lot of water and the light will reflect off the water, sometimes hurting them, um, but it helps them when they're, um, those eyes help to reflect that water off. So humans, we talked about opsin genes earlier. Humans have three. Uh, dragonflies, depending on the species, have anywhere between 15 and 33. Uh, so they can see colors that we've never even imagined, and they can also see in ultraviolet light as well. All right, so that was there's a lot of insects out there. We could go on and on and on about insects, but I just wanted to cover a few. So now we're going to go ahead and move to fish. A lot of people don't think of fish eyes being anything special. Um, they have a lot of challenges that a lot of other animals do not have to worry about. So um, when you're in the water, it's not always clear. Um, there's a lot of light reflecting on things. Sometimes if you're at the very bottom of a lake or a pond or even in the ocean, light doesn't even get there. So how do you see things? The whole important of having an eye is to detect that light. Well, what if there is no light? Um, so they have a complex list of problems. Um, two of the biggest problems that they have to deal with that other animals don't is what's called a refractive index. Um, so basically this is the speed of the light that travels through a material when it's not a vacuum. So if it's water or if it's coming through and absorbing through a plant or a flower or something. So animals in the water have to deal with this. And then also the turbidity of the water. So particles in the water, um, anything from poop to uh, substrate to like pollution in the water, anything that's in the water uh, can cause the light to reflect in different directions um, instead of going forward. Um, so basically the turbidity of the water is how clear the water is. The higher the turbidity, um, the less light reaches the bottom. So if it's very um, murky and dirty, not a lot of light is going to get to the bottom. If it's clear, that water's, that light's going to go right through and it's going to get to the bottom. All right, so what do fish, what does fish vision look like? So most of their eyes are going to be spherical lenses, very similar to, similar to humans. And then many fish possess cone cells that can absorb different wavelengths of light and then ultraviolet light as well. Um, so this feature basically, it has two longer um, wavelength receptors and one shorter wavelength receptor, um, which makes some fish see what's called tetrachromatic. So again, just different types of colors, just depending on where their environment is. <coughs> um, two certain types of fish that I kind of wanted to talk about, there's one called a flashlight fish. Um, so these fish um, express what are called photophores, uh, and they have cells that are capable of producing a luminescence. So kind of very similar to like a bioluminescence. Um, so what happens, but they do it in the retina, and basically they can use this to spotlight their prey. Um, so where these fish live, no light reaches the bottom of the ocean, 
So they can't see in color, but they rely on bioluminescence. So this is how they spotlight their prey. And then anchovies, some of you may have eaten anchovies or, or had them on a pizza, um, but they can detect polarized light, which is most abundant at dawn and dusk. Um, so these animals, they... Um, they're migratory fish, and a lot of migratory fish have this ability. Um, but since the sun travels from east to west, it is believed that this is a really important trait for migratory fish, uh, simply because it can use it as a directional cue, which way to go. Um, but polarized light detection also helps a sense of other fish when they're in a school. So it will reflect off the scales of their neighboring fish so they know which direction to move. So the light helps them being able to migrate um, because of that uh, directional ability, but then also when they're together in a school, it will reflect off the neighboring fish's scales and they can help them move into a school together in kind of that similar fluid movement. All right, pupil. So fish do not have eyelids. Um, but their, their pupil cannot dilate or constrict in a lot of species, not all of them, but uh, most of it is due to the turbidity of the water, so how murky it is. Um, and then fish have actually really small eyes compared to their body size, um, but the size and the shape of the pupil is dynamic and it's based on the amount of available light. So they have the size of their pupil because of how much light gets in. Um, if anyone's ever owned a placostomus, um, you can buy them just about in any uh, fish store, Petco, PetSmart. A lot of people have them in their aquariums. They can get rather big, um, but they have kind of a unique shape of their pupil. It looks like the Greek omega symbol. Um, so if you look, you can kind of see it, it's not a perfect circle, but it kind of looks like an upside down omega symbol. So placostomists have that simply because during nighttime um, or in dark areas where they usually live, um, it contracts, their iris contracts, and they can get more light into their pupil. Um, so during the daytime or underneath the light of an aquarium, for instance, the iris becomes um, really expanded and you can really see that omega symbol in there. But basically it's helping let them, letting them in more light so that they can see. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, reptile eye. So this one, I had to include reptiles because I'm a reptile person. A lot of people believe that reptiles can't see. They have really bad vision. Some people actually believe that they're completely blind. Um, it just, it, it's really variant depending on the species. But when we talk about reptiles, um, very few species are actually blind. Um, most snakes like burrowing snakes are blind or they have very rudimentary eyes because eyes get in the way when you're burrowing and it's dark and you can't see anything. So eyes don't really make sense. So that's why a lot of those species don't have any. They could be blind, but usually it's just very rudimentary, simple eyes. But when we talk about the grand scheme of reptiles, arboreal snakes, so snakes that live in trees, and crocodilians have the most sophisticated eye features. Basically, those animals that live on land, they have to have really good visual acuteness. So what's that structure look like? Um, when we talk about a mammal eye and a reptile eye, the biggest difference between them is the lack of that muscle structure that physically alters the shape of the lens. Um, this helps them with focusing. Um, so basically, instead of the ciliary muscles being contracted, um, it works to increase the pressure in the eye um, and it basically fixes the focus lens backwards and forwards from the retina. Um, so when we're talking about this, when you use a magnifying glass, that's pretty much like the, the snake structure or the structure of a snake eye or a reptile eye. It's usually like a magnifying glass. Um, so snakes can focus on an image um, using the retina, but then the detail of that image is not as clear as what we would see. So they can see the shape, it just wouldn't be as perfectly clear as what a person could see. Um, the European grass snake, uh, which kind of looks like a garter snake, there's not, they're not super, I don't say they're not super interesting to look at, but they're very kind of a simple looking snake. They just look like a garter snake, um, but they have only cones in their eyes that are sensitive to the blue, green, and red colors, um, but they lack this like oil droplet that's in the eye, um, which helps the photoreceptors filter the light. Um, so it does restrict the color changes that they have, um, but for some reason, they're kind of just a unique species in the color channels that they see. Um, something about protection is that many snake species and reptile species have this yellow filter inside of the lens that helps absorb that ultraviolet light, um, especially in crisp crepuscular species, they don't have this at all. Um, so 
Basically, um, having the presence of that vertical pupil, uh, clear lens, it helps a retina and they have a ton of rods. So being able to let that light in in low light situations. And then the pupil um, basically allows that proportionality of light to penetrate the eye. All right. And then what about turtles and lizards? So uh, they don't have the best vision in the world, but the photoreceptors of lizards and turtles, they have what's called multicolored oil droplets, um, which helps them have very good color vision for some reason. So um, within the cones of the retina, they have those proteins called opsins. Um, so the proteins are very sensitive to the wavelengths of light. Um, some of the species can see in UV range, some cannot. Um, and a lot of turtles and lizards can actually see beyond, far beyond the capabilities of humans. So uh, people think we have really good color vision and really good vision. Sometimes we're not even close to that of like a turtle or a, a lizard. All right, and then I wanna finish on bird eyes. So birds are very um, complex uh, creatures as well. So they have pretty good vision. Um, so compared to mammals, birds have larger eyes in proportion to their body and their head. Um, so basically the larger the eye, the larger the image of the retina. So bigger is I guess always better um, when we talk about that, especially in the field of bird vision. They also have a third eyelid, which is kind of unique. Um, a lot of species have this, reptiles have this as well, um, but it's called a nictitating membrane. So it goes across in the horizontal direction and basically it keeps the eye clear from debris. It keeps it moist. Um, for animals like in crocodilians, they will put that um, nictitating membrane down and it's like scuba like built-in scuba goggles when they go underwater so they can shut that they can keep their eye protected but then they can see underwater um, snakes will have this too and birds because birds and reptiles are very closely related to each other um, but when we talk about larger eyes um, bigger usually means better in the vision world um, better vision is helpful because they can avoid collision um, and also when they're flying they have to be able to capture either camouflage Flash prey or fast moving prey in the air. Um, bird eyes, they kind of look small, um, but they're bigger than they seem because of they have feathers and all the um, skin that's around them. Uh, they look bigger than they actually are, or they look uh, smaller than they actually are. All right, so they have better vision. Um, bigger eyes usually means more light receptors. Um, so basically think of it as having a, a big TV. If you have a little TV, um, the pixels are not gonna be as great. If you have an 80 inch huge television screen, you're gonna see a way bigger image. It's gonna have more pixels and the screen and the, the shot is gonna be a lot clearer. Um, especially in diurnal birds that come out during the daytime, they're active as soon as basically the sun comes up. They have to have larger eyes because they are then uh, sometimes active later in the sunrise as well. So diurnal means you're, you have a lot of light to deal with. So your eyes have to be able to adjust to that. Um, shorebirds, there are some shorebirds that forage at nighttime. Some of them have relatively large eyes, as do other nocturnal species like owls, for instance. They just have to let as much light in as they can. And then when we talk about eyes in the bird world, the Australian wedge-tailed eagle, um, we believe has like the best vision of any animal in the world. Um, it has enormous eyes um, compared to those of other birds. And so they have also then very good visual acuity. So um, they can see things very clear. They can tell how far things away, um, but they are considered the best vision in the entire world, hands down. Um, all right. So looking at eyes, um, we probably, a lot of you know this, but I, for birds, they cannot move them in their sockets. They're immovable. So if um, you look at somebody, you tell them to look to the left or look to the right without moving their head, we can do that. There's a little space in our eyes um, sockets and we can move instead of moving our entire head. Birds cannot do that. So if you've ever watched an owl, um, they will move their entire head to look in a different direction. That's because their eyes are literally so wedged into their sockets, there's no room for them to move them. They're so large. Um, so humans, compared to birds, we have really poor color vision. Um, they have four different types of cones. So many birds can see in red, green, blue, and also UV light as well. Uh, so when we talk about those huge eyes, 
space is limited up there. Um, they also don't want to weigh themselves down. So the smaller amount of muscles that they can have, um, it, it's going to help them as well. So they can't move their eyes in their sockets. So they don't need those muscles like people have to be able to do that. So that takes a lot of weight off of their body as well. And then for instance, like raptors, especially, they really need to be able to move their head to see in all different directions. So that helps them too. Um, and then when we talk about the red, blue, green UV vision, um, um, the more types of they have more types of cones and more of them too. Um, they also have that special oil droplet um, in their eyes that allows them to see even more different colors as well. All right, and then I have one more slide here, just a couple of special birds. We have all these birds in Nebraska. So cormorants are really these kind of unique birds. I have a picture of one on the screen here, um, but they are diving birds. So they spend a lot of time diving underwater to get fish. Um, so these guys can actually change the shape of their lenses um, to be more kind of spherical underwater. Um, so it helps the iris open up to get more light when they're chasing those fish in the water. And then earlier I mentioned woodcocks. They're kind of these really cool little animals. People call them timber doodles, but they have that very long straight beak. And then when you look at their eyes, they are set so far back in their head. They almost look like an alien, um, but basically they can see in 360 degrees. So it gives them a very, very large monocular view and they can see predators from all different angles, especially animals like weasels, which are very, you know, we talked about them last week, the mustache. Um, they're very um, agile when it comes to hunting down their prey. And then also eagles. So um, when you go to the doctor, they tell you you have 20-20 vision. Um, well, eagles have the equivalent to 25 vision. Um, so this means that if you look at a, if an eagle looked at something that was 20 feet away, um, humans could only see it about five feet away. Um, so if you could say that an eagle has very good visual acuity um, and about four times better than a human. So um, why do they have this? Because they are the ones finding prey um, from very high in the sky. Uh, hawks have very good vision as well. If you've ever seen like a hawk sit on a light pole, they're looking down constantly. They're trying to find tiny little mice in the sea of grass below them. Um, and they can be so good at they can find it and like um, come down and pounce on it right away. So they need that visual acuity to get their food. I think that's it. All right. So that was what I had today. Um, it was a lot of like heavy information, but hopefully you could kind of see how lots of different animals, they see in different colors. They have those different um, structures, like those opsins and those cones and those rods. And then the field of vision is very different for a lot of other animals. Mostly it's the reason that they have certain things is because their environment, what they're hunting, and if or they are a prey item. So all of those things are advantageous to them um, in some type of way. All right, so next week, we actually do not have a science of. So we have a little break um, for this week. We have a really big event next week. So we just decided to forego science of, um, but we will continue the week after. So November already, gosh, November 2nd, we will be talking about canids. We don't know what a canid is. It's like a dog or a wolf or a coyote or a fox. So all of the kind of dog-like animals. And then November 9th, we'll be doing possum. And then we'll finish out the series on November 16th, uh, right before Thanksgiving talking about venom and poison as well. All right, so if you really liked this, we have a ton of YouTube videos on as far as Science Of goes. There's about 64 uh, videos, I believe. So if you're like, man, I really wish there was a Science Of um, birds. There's a Science Of birds, go check it out. So we also have lots of other different types of educational videos on there as well. We have a really active social media page. So Facebook and Instagram, go ahead and like us on those channels. And then we have our Nebraska Wildlife education website where we have free downloadable activities and a lot of information about teacher workshops, PowerPoints, downloadable lessons, that kind of stuff. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I can go ahead and check the chat to see what we have as far as questions. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we'll see what we have. Okay. Someone asked. Um, What animal sees the best? It's kind of hard to, it's kind of a subjective thing to say. It's like when people ask me what has the most venom or the, the 
which snake is the most venomous? It kind of depends. Are you talking about the amount that they give out? Are you talking about the toxicity of their, their venom? There's a lot of different factors that play involved. Um, I'll kind of let you decide what you think is the best as far as like fish, birds, mammals, insects. They all have different types of things. So it's kind of hard to say this animal sees the best, but we talked about the eagles, the wedge-tailed eagle, and also the mantis shrimp, I think are really unique and cool. Who would have ever thought like a shrimp would have some of the best vision? Like why do they have a shrimp? So it's kind of cool. Um, someone that said, do birds have bigger eyes? So yeah, a lot of our birds here, um, when we talk about that, we, um, they have bigger eyes and that usually consults to bigger vision. It's like the bigger the TV screen, the better pixel and the better images that you're going to see. And then that was it. Okay. All right. So I think that was it. Um, hopefully you guys learned a lot. Hopefully I didn't bog you down with too many details, but you're welcome to watch this over again. I will be putting it up. Give me about 24 hours and I'll put it on our educational YouTube channel and you are welcome to watch it and share it. And then anyone that registered today, whether you missed it or you were here, will get an email from me with some more resources in it as well. And then also information about our other science ofs too. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you not next week, but the week after. So November November 2nd to talk about Canaan. So thanks everyone. And we hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Have a great weekend. Thanks.